Now we're cooking. Hey, Cam, right on. Hold there on. There we go. I got my, my camera <laughs> got messed up. Okay. Cool. Right hey, on. Thanks How for having you, me on. Man? I'm good, yeah. man. Thank you. We had a bunch of people on here waiting for us to get started. I had a little technical difficulties, but I think everything is working well now. So you got a little bit of time? Yeah, man. Yeah, All we right. uh, got the kids, you know. First half of the day, since they're not in school, we got to do homeschool. So that's a challenge. And, um, you know, I'm constantly shuffling around our trips, you know, because most of our trips are international. Right. Um, so right now we're kind of shifting everything to do a lot of, you know, Florida. So I was on conference calls all this morning to set up the yachts and kind of show them the different itineraries that we're going to do instead of going to the Bahamas and international right now. Wow. So the Bahamas is completely shut down mm -hmm. to all international travel, right? You come by boat, come by plane, yep. everything's shut down. Yeah. And I just yesterday, I, some guys said, yeah, you know, we were over there tuna fishing. We just anchored up on the bank, you know, for the night. And I said, man, you cannot do that. The Coast Guard <laughs> and the, um, the guys over there are both patrolling and you absolutely cannot do right, that right now. They will take your boat. So wow. don't, don't play around. You definitely don't want to go to jail in the Bahamas right now. Right. That would be a, that would be a bad deal. What do you think about um, like that decision to, to stay closed? I mean, the Bahamas have zero COVID-19 cases in, that I've heard about, and the, the Americans are dying to get over there and go. So there, I don't know what I think about it. There are a couple different ways to think of it. The first, you think of it from their standpoint, they're a very small group of islands that have very poor medical facilities and the country with the largest number of cases is wanting to pour into there. Right. So yeah. from their point of view, I can understand it. Um, but it's their, their economy is already hurt so bad by the, you know, the Abacos getting smashed by Dorian. This is just like a, a punch while you're down. It, it's really unfortunate for them. Yeah, I know. Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what, I mean, the, the way to, the way to revive the Bahamas is obviously tourism from, from mm -hmm. America, mostly Europeans as well. But you know, when, when they're, it's unsafe, they don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on. This whole COVID-19 thing is just, it's really a mystery to me. Like just, are we doing the right thing? Are we not doing, are we overreacting? Are we underreacting? Like, it's just a weird kind of a situation that nobody, mm -hmm. nobody has any idea. I don't think. <laughs> And I, and I know everybody doesn't want to hear about all that stuff, but in, <laughs> in, to close that off, I will say that I think the best thing to, that will come from this is that people will be more aware of just watching what they touch, watching what they do, and just take precautions, you know, because that'll help us in the long run as a, you know, as a, a world. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, you're exactly right. So, Cam, um, to introduce you to the audience, because not everybody knows who you are, even though you're, you're very well known around the world. So Cam sent me his resume uh, before this. 18-time spearfishing world record holder, 30 world records for his clients on guided spearfishing trips, unlimited tonnage master mariner as a ship captain, United States Coast Guard Silver Lifesaving Medal awardee. He's visited 90 countries, including Antarctica and the Arctic, which I would love to know what you were <laughs> doing there. Uh, and he runs the premier spearfishing guide service for international trips targeting fish of a lifetime, both by yacht and land-based. That's, uh, that's incredible, man. How old are you? Uh, oh, gosh. 40. <laughs> the hardest question of the yeah. day. <laughs> I still feel like I'm in my 20s, except for my back hurting me today. Um, but I'm, I think, uh, 43? 43. 43? Yeah. All right. So, <clears throat> so that's a lot. That's a lot in 43 years. Mm -hmm. So I, I've never had a job that was not on the water. Um, you know, high school, I worked on charter boats in the, in the Puerto Rico and dive boats down in the Cayman islands. And then I went to the merchant Marine Academy to study working on ships, <clears throat> excuse me, and got out of there, started working on ships and the ship jobs, you work for six months of the year and the rest of the time you have off. So, my very first ship I was on, the engineer said, man, don't go home, just travel. I was like, all right. So I just took a backpack and went to Bali and started traveling from there. And that <clears throat> basically turned into the next 10 years 
of traveling in between ships. And I basically went everywhere I ever wanted to go and just immersed myself in each spot. And that's how I became better and better at spearfishing um, and got to travel to all these places on my own dime to figure them out. Um, <clears throat> now it's so easy to go online and find out so much information. Right. But back in the day, you had to be there and you had to put the time in. I mean, you, you guys are down in the Keys. Like, it's old boy network down there. Like, yeah. back in the day, you'd get shut down if, if you burnt the boys. Right. Um, and now it's everybody and their brother. It's the same thing in, you know, many of the different fishing towns. There was that, that level of respect that had to be been built over years and years of working your way up. And, you know, sometimes it was, it was nepotistic. Like you had right. to be family. You had to be a, you know, yeah. Bubba. Yeah. That's something we talk about often on this podcast is how like with the, with the legends, like you get a Robert Trossett or somebody that comes on and we had him on recently with his boys who are mm -hmm. quite a bit younger, younger than me even. And it's like, there's a real difference in how somebody like Robert Trossett started or how somebody I, like, I, like me started and then how somebody that's starting in the business today, like just show it, up like, yeah, it was, it was all about, you know, being first on the water, being last off, mm -hmm. you know, spending your time on the water, getting recommendations from or referrals from other guides. And now it's not that that's not important. It's super important, but it's like, now it's social media. It's, can you build a good website? Are you a good mm -hmm. photographer? Can you take good videos? I don't know. It's just a weird kind of a, kind of a change, you know, I, I bet that's happened in the spear fishing as well um, in your world. <clears throat> it has. And it, it, I always make the joke. It's, you know, there's people that grew up doing all the stuff that we do, hunting, fishing, diving, you know, just outdoors period. And then there's the Insta divers and the Insta fishermen <laughs> that they're in it just for the photo. But, you know, it's good to have programs like you guys have and doing the podcast and stuff because people people can learn from this that there's a lot more to it, you know, than just the photo. It's the adventure to get there and the, the process of figuring all that stuff out. And I hate to say that a lot of that is lost, but a lot of that is lost now, you know, because if you've got the money, you go spend the money on the right charts and the right boat and everything and you can get there. Whereas I mean, even some of those little wrecks that everybody knows about now out in front of uh, Key West, back in the day, I mean, nobody knew about it. Like when right. we were spearfishing um, Wahoo and stuff back in the day with um, with Steve and Rush, it would be like us yeah. and one or two other boats out there. And if they had who's there, they'd call us over and we'd jump in and shoot them there. But now you go out there and it's a, a field day with 100 boats. And there's no etiquette. And it's just, it, it's sad to see. but that's growth, you know? So we're having a little bit of a, of a glitch here, but I think it's all cleared up. So how do you deal with that? Like, that's a fine balance. You are, you are operating worldwide. You're going to mm -hmm. the most um, pristine places in the, in the entire world. If you have your choice, I'm sure you, that's, those are the type of places that you're, that you're seeking out so mm -hmm. that you can be there and, and, and go spearfishing where somebody else has never been in the water before. That's the idea, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how do you balance that? Like what you post online, what <laughs> you, what you talk about, what you write about the photos, like, I mean, are there places that you just, are just off limits you just don't talk about or oh yeah and and we talk to the clients as well like it's you know one of the challenges is <clears throat> and this was one of my worries very early on is okay people are going to try to steal this knowledge and i'm lucky that uh, in the beginning of starting to do the actual charters my clientele was very very high end so we do minimum three-day uh trips so already it's a pretty big investment. And I tell them, I'm like, look, we're going to go to places that provide my family our livelihood. Um, and I've invested my time and money to find these places. I'm happy to take you there, but you got to understand we manage these spots over many, many years. And the other guys that work with me, we communicate about it. So we know that we're going to go to this spot, like the spot we're anchored on here in this in this picture, this mm -hmm. boat is a 185 foot um, boat that the client owns, which that's, that's him there. And um, we're anchored up 
more than 100 miles offshore out in the middle of nowhere. As far as I know, there's only been two other boats there. One, the way, the way I found out about it was my grandfather what used to go there on a ship, and then another yacht had told me about it. So this spot, no one's ever going to go, even if I told where it was. But what advantage does it give me for telling people about it? None. Mm -hmm. And without ever putting up some BS, you know, like I'm still able to keep people entertained. Like it drives me nuts when people tag where they are. Like the day the Cobia show up or the day the tarpon, you know, hit the keys. If somebody posts that the next day, everybody and their brother's going to be out there. Why, why do that? You're right. just taking, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult. And for the guides, my suggestion for the guides would be if and when it turns on, call your clients. You don't have to post it. Wait till the season's over and then start posting it. If you need to fill dates, then, I mean, that's, that's your call, but it, it just brings more and more people out to the spot. And there is only a finite amount of bottom to fish. So you really got to be conscious of, of taking care of those areas. Right. And especially as that applies internationally and, and, mm -hmm. you know, all these other places that you're going, right? Yeah. So like, for instance, like in, in Fiji, we've spent a ton of time in Fiji. I've probably been there 15 or 18 times um, back 15, 20 years ago you would have to go to the local village and each village owned a portion of the reef. And that was basically their refrigerator. So you go to that Island and you present yourself to the chief and you have a ceremony that sometimes it was an hour, sometimes it was three or four hours. You give them kava and you give them some gifts and everything. And you're basically asking permission to use the reef. And um, sometimes you'd go through all that foolishness, have a great time with them and be like, no, nope, you can't do it. But <laughs> it's opened up a little bit now, but, that way of thinking is, is probably the right way to do it. You know, in my opinion, when I come down there to, you know, say, you know, the, the Bahamas, like the far South islands, we always give the guys that are ashore there the fish, you know, give them the first choice. Like, what would you like? Cause they in, in my mind, you know, they're, they're fish. We just went out and got them. Right. You know, and we're always going to have enough to eat for ourselves, but you're taking away their own personal grocery store. So I think people just need to be very conscious of that. The same thing. If I show up to a wreck <clears throat> and you and Steve are out there fishing on it, I'm going to idle up and usually I'm going to idle right up to you straight away and just say, Hey, you know, do you guys mind if we get in when you're done? Or do you mind if my, my classic line is, do you mind if we snorkel around a bit? Uh -huh. You know, because, <laughs> they don't know me from anybody else, you know, and they don't know that I can dive a hundred plus feet and I'll, I'm going to find whatever the heck is there, <laughs> but it's just common courtesy and it's, it's gone out the window in a lot of places. It's, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you don't if spearfish you, if, tarp in here, by the way, <laughs> yeah, if you do know who, who you are or any of the people that you're, you're diving with, um, I'd be happy for you to go down and let me know what's down there. Because uh, that's the best part about filming, like with Jake Perry. I know that you've done mm -hmm. with him yep. too. He's our he's our camera guy, and uh, we stop and and get started, and we don't even start fishing until he takes a couple of dives. He's like, "Yeah, looks pretty good." I mean, mm -hmm. like you guys should probably stay here. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's one thing to look at it on the electronics; <clears throat> it's another thing to have actual eyes down there, which is and, which is pretty awesome. And we fish a lot too. So, like this, uh, recently we were out on some wrecks, and you know, you got the wind and waves going different ways and we're trying to set up the anchor and the guy, you know, anchored up. And I was like, man, I know you're over the, the, the mark, but the fish are 50 yards over here out in the sand. You got to change. And they weren't catching anything. And sure enough, we shifted the boat and put it there. And that's another reason to have good electronics and use your electronics. Here's the structure. Yes. But look where the bait is and look, look where the mass of animals are because the surface wind, surface current is going to be different usually than what's going on underneath. So you spend all this money on electronics, actually use them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the questions I wanted to get to, you, you mentioned that you were, you were in Bali mm -hmm. just with a backpack. And a lot of the people that are listening to this podcast are people that are trying to figure out what it is that they want to do. How did, how did that experience, I mean, like you said, you know, I went out and I did that and, 
And I had an experience kind of like that too. I went to Yellowstone National Park and kind of found myself or found my mm -hmm. calling or whatever and came back. I was kind of a different person. I'm interested in, in what <laughs> you got the homeschooling going on. Yeah, over baby there? girl's coming over. All right, <laughs> good. She's welcome. Um, I'm interested in kind of what in the world uh, happened to you in Bali that, that gave you clarity on what you wanted to do. Um, honestly, the biggest thing, because I was traveling by myself and I had never, never traveled by myself before, Connor, don't knock this down, um, was the realization that you can, you can really be whoever you want. You can be as outgoing or as introverted as you want. If you want your time alone, you can have your time alone. Say, hi, this is Connor. Hey, hi. Connor. And Isla. Hi, Isla. Um, and I set out after What's about a week. Goes? Those are Benita's eating uh, that bait ball out in the Gulf. Um, for me, it was in I can sp in the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, you could spend as much time by yourself as you wanted, or you could go out and talk to anybody. And it really changed my personality in that it allowed me not to have any fear of going up and talking to anyone and just being open. So that was the biggest growth for me. And then the next level of that was opening up and being able to find new spots and to get really, really good at spearfishing and tweak my gear and start videoing as well. Cause back then the underwater cameras were massive. So in addition to the spear gun, I had to carry down this basically five gallon bucket in the other hand to try to film anything. So people would believe me, of what's going on. <laughs> so there was a lot of growth in Indonesia and I, um, again, that place has changed so much in the last, you know, 20 years that I've been going there. It's, um, it used to be just awesome and very, very few people. Um, but there's still amazing fish there. We go there for, for dog tooth tunas, which are about my favorite. That so, is your favorite. That is yeah. a badass looking fish, man. I've never caught cool? one of those. But that is, I mean, the first time I ever saw a picture of a, of one of those, I just thought that's what is, this can't be real. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's like a barracuda tuna. It's the mm -hmm. weirdest thing ever, but those got to be like one of the greatest predators in all of the, in the whole ocean. Man, they are bad. Like you'll shoot a fish and there'll be a frenzy of sharks kind of like this eating it. And a dog tooth will come rushing in and just, uh, I didn't realize you had this video here. So I'm actually going to get bumped by one of these sharks here in a second. Oh You'll really? Okay, cool. Yeah, watch. Um, I think it's it this like, one. It might be. It looks like one. Louisiana. I don't know where that is, but that was our experience in Louisiana, right there. Just yeah, I a can't. Billion of those little sharks everywhere. I can't remember where that was. Um, <laughs> but yeah, those are those are all spinners and black tips, so they're they're not even worried. That's just that same migration that we have off of here. Um, you know, when there's a, a billion of them, but um, yeah. This is what makes diving so awesome is even if you're not getting anything, which we were getting plenty of fish. Uh, I mean, how amazing is this experience? I mean, you would think you'd just be dead right here. Most of us are like, you know, six foot um, sharks. But, but no, uh, I mean, you've, you've got so much experience now. And when I'm, when I'm around, you know, I'm not, I'm not an expert f spear fisherman by any stretch of the imagination. I like getting in the water, but don't have the kind of experience that you or Steve or Jake Perry or any kind of any people like that have. But when I watch Jake in the water, you know, he's totally fine with some situations, other situations. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm always like, look, he's, he's done it before where he says, okay, time to get out. And I'm yeah. like, Okay. No, no arguing. Absolutely. Whatever you say goes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, sometimes I don't even ask him what he saw down there. Like, yeah. just like, yep, time to go. And, uh, but you, you have, I guess, some, some different protocols when you are spearfishing with one of your buddies versus spearfishing with some of your clients. Like there's a skill level, there's a, there's a, a comfort level. How do you kind of communicate with people that you haven't spent as much time with in the water to find out where their comfort level is, where their skill level is and, and like what situations you're going to be comfortable mm -hmm. taking them. I'm sure just like a fishing guide that happens very, very quickly after you've been mm -hmm. at it for a while, but you know, it's kind of a something that I'd like to know about as well. So one thing that is unique with our business is unlike a normal fishing charter, which is usually you guys got a new six pack every day or two or three guys, whatever we have the same groups over and over. So, and again, they're usually three or more day trips. So before,
any trip, everybody has to have a free dive. For anybody watching here, if you're even yeah. remotely interested in free diving and spearfishing, go take There's no better preparation for it and we won't do a trip unless someone has had that um it teaches now, you, you the safety that. you offer that as well as other people right like you're we do you yep. have those classes but there's other classes besides your own classes, correct right? obviously get it from whoever but if you guys want a class contact me and i'll get you set up um so that gives you a baseline to work off of because you're the most dangerous thing in the water to yourself mm. and, you know, to everything around you, if you're a good spear fisherman. Um, but being safe in the water is the most important thing. And I want the clients to be able to watch me too, because the only thing that matters is that everybody comes back when I mean, we are going to get good fish, I promise you, <laughs> but safety is, is the paramount thing. And, um, you know, the environmental factors, it it's a it's a play by play call if that if that's a good way to explain yeah. it you know well, the ocean's a very fluid place you've got all kinds of things are changing mm -hmm. all the time right and you can tell you know the personalities of the shark so, okay we know we're in the bahamas we're going to dive this cut that's like a guaranteed chance for a shark to come that is very conditioned to even hearing the pole spear go. So you shoot that fish, you get him out of the water very quickly. And some, you're always looking down and around people get so focused on looking at like what's in their hands. They don't look at the big picture, you know, and that's how you get hurt. Um, but yeah, there's definitely situations where, you know, you're like, okay, it, it's about to get bad here. Don't shoot anything. Let's, mm. let's move. Got it. Yeah, that's in that's uh and you can you can see that like with with enough experience like you can mm -hmm. see the attitude of all the animals and it's like man if we shoot something it is on. I mean right. you can see that above the water, you know, when you're mm -hmm. fishing it's like okay, now it's time to put the bait in because yeah. the chum has worked and it's 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 happening. Mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> so a couple of people uh chimed in there while we were talking about that that the video froze for just a second. They were wondering about the info on the classes. Uh, let's talk about your classes. Where do, where do you find out about your classes and how would somebody take one of your classes? You just send me a message. So we do all private classes. Most of what we do is go to the people's house and we'll teach the, we actually have one going on today. So it's four hours of classroom where you teach everything you could ever imagine about free diving your body and the process of free diving. Um, and then you take that the next step is the pool, which you usually do in the afternoon. And that's about three hours in the pool with just refining your basic technique and getting your breathing, um, you know, uh, kind of trained up. And then there's about another three or four hours out in the open water. And then, excuse me, the entry level course uh, takes you to you still there. Yep. Um, I, can, I can hear you. The video froze for a yeah, second. Yeah, I'm froze up. It looks pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll catch up, I think. Uh, so the open water portion, we take you to, um, I think the max is 66 feet. And I would be very surprised that anybody that's here talking back and forth wouldn't be able to do a three-minute breath hold and 66 feet. You want to kick me out and then kick me right back on and see if it unfreezes? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's see what happens. The comments are still coming through, but uh, yeah. we'll we'll try for just a second longer. So you think <laughs> that you can you can get pretty much anyone to a three minute breath hold and sixty six feet deep? Mm -hmm. Yep, and that'll be so. That's our next challenge. If and when you and I can get together, I'll come down there and I'll teach you the class. And Man, I'm pretty much I would guarantee. Love that. Yeah, and it, it would, makes it makes a big difference, you know, in in what opportunities it opens up for for diving let's yeah kick, let's kick for me sure. off real quick okay. and then, I'll, then have okay we're gonna we're gonna stop this and then we're gonna come back so all you people come right back everybody will return um sorry about the sorry about the delay sorry about the technical issues Hopefully Cam is going to be be right back here. Um, seeing him 
yet. Maybe I missed him. Okay, we're, we're talking about the um, free diving classes. He believes that, uh, there's Cam, okay. Okay, so we're picking up uh, back where, where, uh, where we were. Cam's going to be on here. There he is. Okay, so we were, pick, we were talking about the free diving classes mm -hmm. and how you feel like anybody can get to three minutes and 66 feet after mm -hmm. just a little bit of instruction. Yeah, basically a day and a half class. And it's, it really is eye-opening. Uh, you know, I, I grew up spearfishing. My family spearfished. All of our extended family from the Cayman Islands spearfished. So we just grew up doing it. And we didn't have any technique. We just powered through it. And I didn't take the class till I was probably – in my mid thirties. And I was like, nobody's teaching me anything about free diving. I mean, we've been diving hundred foot since we were kids. And the first day of the first class, I was like, holy cow, how are we alive? <laughs> like just the, the smoothness of the way that the instructor dive and, and the way he showed us how to do it and the way to do the breathing. I was like, Oh my God, like, I can't believe we didn't, we didn't do this. And it, it's pretty amazing. And it's nice to have, raw talent like people that have never done it and don't really have any bad habits it's really nice to teach them but that's a part of being a, a good teacher is the challenge of also being able to teach an old dog you know who's stubborn mm. you know yeah so but it, how important it, do you think it is what about like breath hold uh in particular how important is uh you know physical conditioning to the length of breath hold does that does that translate? Like if you're in better shape, you're probably going to be able to learn a little faster or is it all about technique? It's a combination for sure. It's a, it's a balance. Um, obviously the better shape you're going to be in, the less fatigued you're going to get. Um, you know, I'm, I couldn't go out and run a couple miles, but I can out swim anybody. Like I can swim all day. It's just the way my muscles are in my legs. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're able to, to be in, in relatively good shape, like anybody that bikes or runs or does a cycle or whatever, like they're, they're going to be fine. Um, you know, and your body is used to straining itself and then relaxing, straining itself and relaxing. Cause that's what you're doing all day long. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So I did, uh, ask or, or told people that, um, I was going to leave a little bit of time for some questions. I have some questions I'd like to just kind of fire at you real quick and uh, sure. you can spend as much time or as little time and I'd want to leave time for some people to ask questions since this is our first uh, live Instagram podcast inspired by you, by the way. I love what <laughs> you're doing with your, your with uh, the evening things. Very disappointed yeah. that you didn't get Mark the Shark on yet. Has that happened oh, or man. did I miss it? Or I haven't done it yet. He's such a pain. <laughs> he's, yeah. He's a well, I had, he was on this podcast too. It was, uh, yeah. it was the most controversial, the most popular, the most shared podcast of any of them that we've done. Um, yeah. he's, he's a, he's a very interesting guy. I actually quite he's, enjoyed spending some time with him. Uh, despite what you think man. of him, <laughs> dude, the guy works yeah. 400. I mean, he's, he takes 400 trips a year. How do you not learn something? Yeah. Spending 400 days a year. He, anyway, an this one's not about Mark the Shark. I, I just, uh, I just <laughs> kind of saw your stuff, and uh, I thought what you were doing on Instagram Live was really cool. I thought we'd try it here too. So, um, okay. So what do you think about competitive spearfishing? I know that you've had a, you've had a background in that. Um, is that a thumbs up or thumbs down? I'm here with it. Okay. <laughs> you know, I, I think that it, it has its place, but – I'm sad that, that I think that it is kind of, it's, it's been on its way out for a long time and the people that are most involved continue to shoot themselves in the foot with it. So mm. I, it's, it's mostly a thumbs down for me. Okay. That's a very similar kind of feeling to a lot of the fishing tournaments. It, a lot of it goes to the organization and the rules and then the politics that go into it as well. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> okay. Um, what do you think the cheapest thing that determines success or failure in your business is? Say that again now. What is the cheapest thing? The cheapest thing. Yeah. Is there, is there something, I, I could give you an example of, of what I think the cheapest thing that if, You're talking about that, like equipment? Yeah. 
Yeah, something that's crucial to your success that is very uh, cheap, easy it's, to find. It sounds simplistic, but your mask, if you don't have the right mask, you're, you got no reason to be in the water. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was going to say boat plug for me. Uh, <laughs> if I don't have a boat plug, it's not happening. Okay. What's your absolute favorite fish to spear and why? Oof. I got to give it a tie with dog tooth tunas and wahoo. Um, mm. I love dog tooth tunas just because I think they're the ultimate challenge. And um, that was the first major world record that I have that was kind of wow. And it held for many, many years. And then I beat it again with another one that just blew everybody out of the water. Um, they are the perfect combination of, it's like having a big yellowfin tuna and a Kubera personality and bodies combined. Um, you shoot them and they're on the edge of the reef and they dive down 150 feet and wrap up in the rocks or go in a hole and break you off. Um, Wahoo are, everyone is unique. Um, I'm sure you've hunted mutton snappers. They're very similar in that each one has their own personality. And the trick is to be able to look at the whole school of them and be like, that's my bitch and find the right <laughs> one and be able to bring him over. And for me, I'm always patient enough to wait for the big ones um, because when those opportunities come, when you've got a hundred of them there, I'm not going to pull the trigger on the first one. I've had many, many times where that opportunity has come up and I've been like, okay, this is your one chance to shoot the fish of a lifetime. Hold off and try to bring the biggest one to you. And there's just not a lot of people that are patient enough to do that. So, I've so had, are, are you right next to them kind of touching their arm? Like, no, no, not, not, not yet. Like, it's and then correct. right there. It's timing. Or, yes. It's timing. Yep. And but you can, but can you have that too. kind of communication with them to where you're either tactile, oh, yeah. you're touching them or they can see you all the time or do oh, you yeah, prefer to be behind them? You're talking about the, the client? You're, yeah, your client, yeah. I, I've got them right beside me, and I've got a death grip on their arm. And I, will not <laughs> let them, and I will not let them leave the surface. And what I do is I just squeeze when the right one is coming. And it's, that's part of the knowledge that we impart on our clients is how to do that themselves. Because as much as I would love to be there on, on every trip they do, it's just not realistic. And I tell people, I'm like, more so than any fish we're going to get this trip, the amount of knowledge that you're going to get each day is 20, 30 years of trying to figure it out on your own and even diving with other people because this is our specialty. And I mean, we are, I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible to see the jump in clients' skill level, um, even mm. in a very short period of time. Yeah, cool. Um, is there ever been, a, has there ever been a book that you've read that you like so much that you gave away a copy? Oh yeah, a lot of them. Okay, what's um, the most gifted book then? Uh, a Land Remembered. Who wrote that? Do you know? Oh, gosh. What's it about? I've never read that book. A, a land, land Remembered. A Land Remembered. Uh, somebody will probably chime in here. And if somebody can look it up while we're doing this. Um, so Land Remembered is about old Florida, basically. Okay. A, a family that after the Civil War moved down to North Florida out in the boonies um, and basically started catching cattle and raising cattle and then how they – um, you know, made nice. a living from it through generations. It was pretty That's what a Florida cracker is. I learned is. that from, uh, from Robert Patrick Arrington Smith. told me the, right. the, the story about why they call them Florida crackers and mm -hmm. the, the whipping, you know, and, and moving the cattle through all old Florida. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Okay. I'll put that one on my list. Yep. Patrick um, Smith is the author. Okay. Thanks guys. Who, uh, who is the best spear fisherman in the world that you've never heard of? GR Tar. And who is he? He's a he's red tide spearfishing on the west coast of Florida. He's wow, got, there was no hesitation there. Yeah, definitely not. He's, he's <laughs> one of my, my best buddies. And a lot of what I figured out, we figured out together. Or on these long drives, me traveling all over, we just get on the phone and just talk and just figure stuff out. And he's very hands-on, too. Um, but he, he just turned 60, and I put him up against any diver in the world. He won our nationals last year and beat everybody at 60 years old. He's nice. a phenomenal diver. Like he shot, there's a picture on my Instagram or whatever. His, um, he shot a monster black, probably over a hundred pounds. And all he got back was the head and he shot at 127 feet free diving. Dang. It's like two years ago. Beast. Yeah. He's That's an a animal.
beastly. <laughs> all right, so we've all had in our career getting to getting to whatever point it is that we we are in our career. We've all had success. We've all had failure. I know you have. I have. What mm -hmm. failure has taught you the most? Um, judging people, honestly. And, you know, like I said, the only thing that matters for us is that everybody comes back. And I'm honestly, I'm almost able to tell over the phone now. Uh, you know, when you first start a business, you're pretty hungry and you're, you're, you want to take everybody you possibly can. But learning to say no to people is difficult. You know, when you know it's not the right thing, you need to be able to say no. And um, that's how you put yourself in trouble. We call it the race car mentality because we've got some clients that are race car drivers. And it is all the people that we deal with are the absolute elite in whatever business they do. So they're very, very strong personalities and very driven people. Um, I've had so many of them tell me, you are the only person I've ever listened to in my life. <laughs> You know, yeah. and that's very important because I'm the one that's going to help them get home. Um, but it's up to them to want to. And there's some people that just do not have that synapse in their brain that has that self-preservation gene, you know. So you, you got to be able to say no, you know, when you know it's not right. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, that's when you that's when you know that you're you're doing pretty well. And, and you know, the the outdoor profession, I guess, is when you start being able to pick your clients and just saying, you know what, this is not a good fit. Like we're going to go out, you're going to catch some fish or you're going to spear fish or whatever. But I really think that somebody else would be better for you. And, yeah. and you watch them go with that other person and they have a wonderful relationship for mm -hmm. 10 years. And you're just like, good. That yeah. was great because it just wasn't going to work out for yeah. us for whatever reason, you know, mm -hmm. personality wise or whatever you guys are getting uh, put on a, on a boat, very mm -hmm. close quarters with people. So I would imagine you have to be, um, and international travel and on and on and on mm -hmm. that makes, you we, know, tight quarters makes for, uh, uh, we, we have no hours. We're 24 seven with our clients. And I mean, some trips are two weeks. So from dawn till dusk and through the night, like if they want to do something, we're ready to roll. So personality is very key. And, uh, you know, like you said, you, you, um, recommend a client to, to somebody else. I've got three other guys that work with me and I love these clients to death, but just personality wise and the way they like to do things, they'll end up being career clients for, you know, the guys that work with me and that's fine, right. you know, cause yeah. all in the end, I just want everybody to have fun. Right. Yeah. Good attitude. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what's one thing that the spearfishing community does not know about you? Oh, <laughs> Jeez, I don't know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty open. Um, gosh, I don't even know. Okay. I'm going to well, come back to that one. You're an open book. All right. Probably, so, probably much about my wife, to be honest. Yeah, there you go. Because I uh, keep her under our, wraps pretty good. Okay. Well, speaking of that, um, you, you just had your two children there. Mm -hmm. Has becoming a father um, changed your risk assessment or your, your, your risk tolerance at all? Yeah, for sure. I've always got something in my mind, you know, like um, I've, I've always had that preservation gene, you know, where I want to come home. Mm -hmm. um, and the number one rule in free diving is don't dive alone. But there's been opportunities many times over the years where I dove alone. It just wasn't feasible. Um, and then when I started dating my wife and I knew there was no way I was ever going to upgrade from this, I didn't want to blow that. So, you know, I'd, I'd be down and I'd have a chance at a fish and be like, you know what? this is not worth it. Let's go up. There'll be another chance for that. But a second here or there will make a big difference. Um, when I first, you know, started going on these trips, when I had my kids, I would take and I still do, I take something of my kids with me every day. Mm -hmm. And I usually put it on my on my knife. So that's on my weight belt. So I'm constantly there touching it. And it's just a good reminder. And it shows yeah. the clients too, like, hey, you know, he wants to come back, you, right. you want to come back too. I love that. That's so, that's so cool. Um, okay. So, uh, I want to leave time for a couple of questions from, from the people here. So we'll, we'll get to one. Chris mm -hmm. H Jarrett says, what tips do you have for getting from spearing in 70 to 80 feet of water to a hundred to 120? That's level two class for sure. Um, and again, contact me for that because 
all these, the majority, all the free dive classes were written for free divers. Um, we teach it for spearfishing. So we teach the same content, but we teach more body positioning and how to hunt and incorporate that, which is two different kind of skill sets. Because being a strong free diver is only so valuable. You've got to be a strong spear fisherman too. Like you got to be a good hunter. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to know before we get to uh, other questions is you're going international trips. You're, you're doing something that is extremely dangerous. You're taking people with a variety of skill levels and interest levels probably. Um, what kind of uh, medical do you have? Are you like an EMT or or do you have any sort of, of medical background? Lots. Lots. Yeah. So from working on the ships, like when I stopped working on the ships, the last five years that I worked, I was a captain. So um, basically I have a license that I can captain anything that floats. Um, you, I, have, I have a list of certifications like this from, you know, fork truck driver to crane operator. <laughs> and about this much of it is medical stuff. Because when you're on a ship, if something happens and you're between right. China and, and California – you're it, you know, you got to deal with it. So I have had a lot of it and we do trauma training as, as well with our, um, with our other guides. So everybody is trained up on that. Um, our big challenges are, you know, boat strikes. If somebody ever got hit by a boat or a prop, um, yeah. then obviously shark bites and getting stuck or something, allergic reactions, all that stuff. So everybody, no matter what you do in life should have at least some basic classes. Sure. Are there ever um, places that are so remote, like when, I mean, you have, you know, a 150 foot boat can go pretty much anywhere, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. There's, there's, I mean, you're, you're with people who have boats that could absolutely go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Does it ever get so far out that you start factoring in, okay, well, there's going to be no medical opportunity here? We always have, a, we have a plan. So that's one of the assessment. We do like a risk assessment and yeah. the clients always have, have an out. Um, and we've done it with the Bahamas a lot as well. And there's our big, and this is something for everybody, whether you're fishing or diving in the Bahamas or when you're far out, you need to be able to make the decision. Okay. Is it better for me to go to the Bahamas right now? Or even if it's 120 miles to just start hauling ass back to the U S and call the coast guard on the way. And generally that is a better call is to start running back to the U S and call the coast guard. Cause they can come out a lot farther to pick you up. And in the Bahamas, man, it's, it's scary. Like when I, mm. I cut my finger off in the Bahamas and I walked out of the, the, uh, the emergency room and it, cause I mean, I felt like I was going to bleed to death. Right. It was, it was pitiful and I stopped so bleeding and everything. Yeah. It's just better to, to make the run back, mm -hmm. get to Miami or, or Fort Lauderdale or wherever you're, is in some mm -hmm. cases. Yeah, I can see that. Um, one question here, what kind of dry land training can you do to imp improve your breath hold? Just stay in good shape. Biking, running, anything like that is, is going to help. Um, you can research online breathing tables, um, and there's some mm -hmm. apps to help your breathing. But honestly, being in good shape, being able to relax in the water, doing yoga, and doing that deep diaphragmatic breathing helps immensely. Hmm. That's cool except don't do that around the water, right? Yeah, don't, it's always don't been ever the, train in the water. The majority of deaths are in the pool. So never never train in the pool unless you're with another certified free diver buddy. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, I had um, one of my friends, Toby Hansen, he asked what your dream fish would be to spear. It Big or small, doesn't matter. Is there is there a fish that has eluded you or one that is particularly attractive to you big eye tuna big eye tuna so one of, one of my goals this year is this is a challenge because i don't get that many opportunities to actually spear because i'm usually guiding but <clears throat> one of my goals this year is to shoot a big eye with a pole spear mm, with um, a pole spear wow that's awesome so we've had <laughs> i've had clients shoot two or three of them big ones like the smallest one i think was 150 or 180 um and we had Another client shoot a 282, and I had one come up in the chum a couple of years back that I thought was every bit of like 275, 280, and I chummed him <clears throat> for 45 minutes until I ran out of chum, and the clients missed him seven times. Oh, and the I think the video is up on my 
my YouTube, but it was here actually in Ascension. So you can see how blue the water is around this sailfish. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was so painful. Like they missed him so many times. And the, I was talking about this uh, the other night on the podcast, like I came to the surface and I was crying at the end of it. <laughs> They're like, I'm so oh, I know the sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> I know the feeling. It, it, it seems like that would be, you know, you can have the same feeling with a, with a, mm -hmm. a eight pound permit when, yeah. when the thing is just dying to eat the fly in front of the boat. And, mm -hmm. and it's just like, I mean, you could literally throw it out there with your hand and they don't get it for whatever so, reason. So here's a question for you. So having spent a lot of time both in shallow and deep water, do you think permit are a deep water fish or a shallow water fish? I think they're a deep water fish that has a shallow water behavior. I think that they, uh, that's, that's a learned behavior. Um, mm -hmm. just like the mutton snapper. I think the mutton snapper is a learned behavior too. They, they go up there and they can, they can eat on the flat. That's probably not where they're the most comfortable, which is why they're hard to catch and really spooky because they're, mm -hmm. they don't have a hydrodynamic body like a bonefish. Like a bonefish is obviously a fish that is probably more comfortable in shallow water than deep water, even though you catch them in deep water and you catch mm -hmm. them in shallow water. But it just seems like that is one that has just, you know, is perfectly designed for, for the shallow water. Mm -hmm. Where the permit, it still looks like an offshore fish that's just up in really shallow water. Right. So You wouldn't think that a, a fish that lives up on the flats would be that dark either, like with that, yeah. the top fin and everything. And we yeah. see... And you do as well. I mean, you guys fish the heck out of them. I cannot tell you how many thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands we see on the reef, in caves, out in the blue water. Like, it's, I think it's a rarity that they come up on the flats. And it's, yeah. that's one of the allures for you guys is, okay, hey, this is such a cool fish already. They're so powerful. When you hook them, they are going to get off this flat and go back to where they want to be. Right. Yeah, they're my favorite fish by far. Um, I think just because I started in Key West and that was just the kind of the target destination for people to go down there. So they were already hard to catch. And so if you came back and you didn't catch any, it was no big deal. So as mm -hmm. a very rookie guide, I was like, well, that's a good one for me to go for because they're, you know, did you catch any? Nope. And mm -hmm. it was like, it was cool, you know? So I, I, honestly, it took the pressure off fishing for a fish like that where mm -hmm. some people would be like man that's the fish that you decided to go for but <laughs> like for me it was like no pressure because very few people caught them and so if you didn't catch one it wasn't like you know you go tarpon fishing and everybody catches three or four and mm -hmm. you catch zero day after day after day <laughs> 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 so I, I always thought it was less pressure but uh but i love them i just think that they're uh they're a very interesting fish they all got different personalities you approach each of them a little bit differently based upon the behavior that you see very much like spearfishing. Like, mm -hmm. like you're talking about the Wahoo, like that's the one right there. Right. That's the one, that's the one that keeps doing this little, little turn. And here's the way I'm going to get him. I mean, it's the same kind of thing with permit. It's like mm -hmm. you look out there on some of them and you're just like, not, e not even worth trying. That thing is so edgy that, <sighs> that we're never getting close to him where this one coming down here is so stupid. We're <laughs> definitely going to catch it. Yeah. <laughs> But you don't sometimes, you know. But so here, uh, here's the next question: When's the last time you kept one? Uh, the last time the tail got bit off of one by a, mm. by a shark, which is, kind of, you know, it happens regularly. But you know, uh, you know, a little lemon shark or something that comes in can bite the tail off of a permit. I mean, and that's usually where they take them out at the motor. Mm. And then I always keep them, and they're very mm. good. But I, I, I don't keep them if you know, just just for keeping them. There are other fish. I just catch a few snappers on the way home and, and we'll Which, be good. I think I already know the answer to this because this is a, a total keys mm. fish. But what are your thoughts on spear and permit? Uh, well, I would imagine that they'd be pretty easy to spear uh, mm -hmm. just with my experience of swimming with a few. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I think about that. I think that uh, – there's a big controversy right now about, you know, the Western dry rocks and what's going on out there and just this complete protection. And I don't even know where I stand on that, quite honestly, mm -hmm. because I don't think that the, you, you have, you have, um, I mean, the flats guides are not going to like what I have to say, but you have, you have, uh, you know, some data who knows if you, you don't have the other side providing data. So the data could be very one-sided. I don't know. I think that, that it's a very emotional 
issue because both the offshore fishermen that want to fish western dry rocks love the permit. They want to catch them. It's a big part of what they do. The flats guides obviously love the permit to a point of being um, like a religion. And so you have differing opinions, and but both parties want to protect the fish. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Do I think that you could spear permit? I mean, if you if you um, have a limit on them that is sustainable, one per vessel per day, you know, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, that I, mean, I think that the fishery, that you always have to be fair to all people, all fishermen, because, you know, if you, if you completely exclude the commercial fishermen or you have the bait guys versus the fly guys or the spear fishermen versus the, the conventional fishermen, you know what, generally the fishermen lose mm -hmm. because you're getting, you're ta well, there's not a lot of us anyway. We all want to protect the fish so that we can keep doing what we love to do. And then if you split us into these little groups, it's very easy for somebody to come out there and just say, well, you know what, we can, we can have it our way, which right. is we want to catch all of these. Or the law enforcement says, you know what, there's no way we can enforce what kind of fly these guys are throwing there's no way we can enforce what kind of, you know, spear these guys are using or how many. We're just going to close it down because mm -hmm. we don't have enough law what enforcement happens? to do what we want. So I don't know. You know, I think it's – I don't like closure. I think that once things close, you rarely get them back. back yeah. So, I mean, you look at Bahia Honda – I mean, not Bahia Honda, um, um, Boca Chica Beach – you know, when I first started fishing in Key West, you could fish all the way up and down Boca Chica Beach. Now, they, you, you would think that you were committing a felony if you went there and threw a cast net or whatever. Really? Yet, um, jet skis run up and beach themselves on the, on the, on the bar, and, and it's just a weird thing. But they closed that down and said, we're going to do fish counts here, and we will reopen this when the fish counts show that we should, which, in my opinion... I mean, there's never, ever been another word about reopening Boca Chica Beach. Not one. Mm. And we just lost it. And so I don't think that that was the result that anyone wanted. And I, and I don't think that if they just closed Western Dry Rocks to fishing entirely, that that's the result that anyone wants. Mm. Like, I, I just think that we all ought to try to get together, understand what each other's, um, what each other, what each group wants and then try to figure out how that's a sustainable way to, to move on. Right. And sometimes it's not. Like sometimes fishing, fishing methods are too effective, and you, you just, you're going to eliminate the species like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. Yeah, it's what do you think about spear and permit? Um, we shoot them. I mean, there's, it's a good eating fish. Uh, as far as I can see, you know, the numbers of them are, are good. Um, it seems like they repopulate pretty darn well, and we just do it within reason, you know, mm -hmm. and m majority of the time we pass them up and we you know, tell the clients like, look, if you really want one, you can get one, but we're going to get other fish. There's other stuff that's better eating. These things fight hard and you got to make the call. If there's Goliaths around, they're going to get them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can, if there's a school of APs, African Pompano and Permit on the same wreck, nine out of 10 permit are going to get eaten by a goliath or by a shark the sharks are not afraid of them the ap's though when you shoot those the goliaths don't usually get them and the sharks won't eat them we've only had like <laughs> one per, uh, ap ever eaten isn't um, that funny how yeah, that i, I mean scared of them. it's a weird it's a funny thing though like there's just like certain baits like you put down a certain bait and the, and a fish won't won't bite it but you put down another one that's slightly different mm -hmm. like a blue runner versus a you know something else and then and and they just like a blue runner versus a Jack Cravel, you get bit on a blue runner like immediately. But if you put down a little Jack Cravel about the same size, eh, not, not so much, That's you know, in a lot of places. And I don't know what that is or, or why. Um, what do you think about the lionfish situation? It's so far out of control. There, it's, there's obviously no way to ever stop it. Like it started with whatever, one or a half a dozen of them. It's unstoppable. Um, I've unfortunately been hit twice by them. It is not fun. Um, now, when you say you got hit by them, you're free swimming and get hit, or you, you spear one and you're, you're getting it back in the boat or putting it in the cooler or something, and, and you get hit? Free swimming. The, the, most recent really? time, the most recent time I got hit, I was getting a big grouper out of a hole in the Bahamas, 
And as I was pulling the, the fish out, he pulled me and there was a lionfish right oh. there and it went into my, my shoulder here. Um, and the first time I got it, I was filming a client and I was down coming down to the bottom and I was like, Oh, and I hadn't even hit the bottom yet. And I looked and I was like, Oh, come on. And that one hit me like right here in the, in the wrist. Mm. Let me tell you that sucked. It, it so what do you do? The number one thing to do is to put as hot a water as you can possibly take on it. Kind of like a stingray. Um, and then like take Tylenol or Benadryl or something like that. But that one, because it was so close to all the veins and blood vessels and everything, holy cow, it, it, it screwed me up, man. I was sick for like probably 12 hours. Um, wow. It, it sucks. Yeah, I've heard of people kind of like kind of like the COVID-19 thing. Some people are getting very sick. Other people, not so much. I've heard the same thing with the, with the lionfish stings that some people, like I know one guy almost lost his hand and uh, I, don't, I don't know if he just got MRSA in there as well as the lionfish sting, but he really had a hard time with his hand. Other people I hear, you know, it, it really hurt, but you know, it, no, it, no danger. It definitely depends losing. on where they hit you and with what fins and how bad, you know, um, both, the ones that hit me were not very big ones. They were only this big. And I mean, the second time the one that hit me in the shoulder, I was like totally prepared. I was on a 53 hydrosport and I said, go boil water. <laughs> so we had like as hot a water as I could take. And I took a bunch of Tylenol and it was fine. I dove through the rest of the day. No worries. But that first one, I mean, I, I was down for the count for like 12 hours. Yeah. So uh, a couple of people were asking what hot water does. And then uh, Don the Hasselhoff, said it denatures the poison, denatures the protein of the poison, which is, that was my understanding of what it does too, but it makes it stop hurting, just like a, <laughs> just like a stingray. <laughs> makes it stop hurting. And obviously uh, clean it with soap and water immediately, as you should with any of those different things. And part of our stuff that we do with kids on our, on our trips is we go through like basic boat safety, different stuff on the boat to teach them about the boat. And for XYZ, you know, shark bite, stingray spine lionfish what is the thing to do for that jellyfish mm. or whatever so that they take that knowledge with them and it's it's basically a summer camp for kids you know on mm. on the boat every day oh that's cool that's cool you and and i would imagine that a lot of your clients are bringing their family like mm -hmm. that's this this is their family kind of thing and you you almost become part of the the family just like a lot of the people that i know that work on private private boats like as a fishing guide or just the captain they kind of become part of that mm -hmm. family that's and and i'm sure you have clients that you've been working with for a long time uh that are like family right oh yeah all of them yeah it's, it's... um okay a couple more questions and then i know you gotta you gotta go you're you're mm -hmm. one of, one of the things that i didn't read in your resume is i read this long resume and then at the end it says also uh runs homeschool and <laughs> i that don't is run the most... homeschool i'm an assistant <laughs> i'm an assistant assistant teacher assistant at that. principal <laughs> yeah and janitor i'm part yeah. of, mostly a janitor so of all the things that you've done and all the fish that you've shot is that easier or harder than being assistant janitor and assistant principal at the home school during covid19 this is way harder being assistant <laughs> janitor it's yeah, way, way I'm with harder. you it's uh I, I was before we before we started i was telling you my kids are now 22 20 and 16 it's a little different having them at home but um man to be cooped up in a house with a couple of a little kids. I mean, are you, you are getting outside, right? Oh yeah. My wife as is as much as possible. Like she's, she's crushing the homeschool thing. So thankfully I've got her. Yeah. Cool. Okay. This last question came in. What's the weirdest object you've seen or found underwater? Oh man. I found a lot of weird stuff. Um, I think the weirdest things, um, I found a, I found a, a number of, of good sized shark's teeth like this, like actually mm. in the, in the rivers here in Florida, um, like out at our hunting camp. Um, but gosh, the weirdest thing I saw a sawfish the other day, which was pretty wild. Um, that's mm. the first one I've seen in all the millions of dives that I've done. It was giant. It was like 14 foot. I put the video up on my YouTube. Um, is that deep water or shallow water? Or how'd... It was like 85, 90. Really? Mm-hmm. We I'll see quite a video. few of them. We see quite a few of them in, in shallower water. You know, mm -hmm. they get, they like those channels and stuff and then they'll, they'll get up on the, on the flat mm -hmm. as well. Actually, I thought I had, um, uh, I don't know. It'd probably take too long to find it here, but, uh, I do have a, a drone video of one up on the flat. Um, 
Okay, so what, two, two last questions. What's your uh, definition of a successful trip? Everybody has a time of their life. You know, I want, I want people to say at the end of the trip, that was the best trip of my life. And I can't tell you how often that happens. And each time we're like, well, we're, next one we're going to have to do something better. And we do. Mm. And it's, I, I kid you not, like these people, you know, that we go with are such wonderful humans. Like they've done everything. They've gone around the world. They're very humble and they're all family oriented and they're just looking to have a good time. So they put a lot of trust in us to plan, you know, their yearly adventures with their family and do cool stuff. And it, it creates that constant challenge to do something better, you know? And I, I when I look at trips, I think big, you know, yeah. like when people are like, oh, well, let's go dive. I'm like, all right, but let's like really go dive. Let's really do something cool. And that's what, that's what gives us our edge is, you know, we, we go way beyond you know, what anybody would ever think. Yeah, man. I mean, I was thinking about that last night when I was talking, thinking about all the different questions I wanted to ask you and things. And one thing that, that struck me is, you know, when I first started guiding in, in Wyoming, I fished on a couple of rivers. And at the time I thought, man, I'll never learn this river as well as mm -hmm. that guy over there. And then the next thing, you know, a couple of years later, you're like, oh, I, I got that river down pretty good. Now I'm going to move and I'm going to find this river and this river and this river. And then you start fishing in the Keys and it's like, oh boy, mm -hmm. I hope I can find Daunting. my way to the other side of the Northwest Channel, you know? And then, mm -hmm. and then you're like, but Steve Huff, he knows all the Keys and he knows 10,000 islands. And how in the world would he ever figure out where to fish? I mean, that must be so confusing to know where the fish are in all those places. And sooner or later, you know, it was like, okay, now I know a lot more of the Keys and I... And yes, it was confusing, but but it was also very um, comforting to know, mm -hmm. okay, it's blowing 25 out of the north. These are the places that I can go. And when, I, when, I, when you, when I read about what you do, you're doing this in the world. Mm -hmm. Like there is no condition, there's no season, there's no anything that could happen. You got a typhoon over here, you got a hurricane over here. Well, that means that we go over here to this other right. part of the world. Exactly right. How, how did that develop for you? Like all of a sudden you're, you're like operating on a worldwide scale. And I know a lot of that is the customers that you have and the equipment that they have, but the, mm -hmm. but you know, once you gain all that knowledge, is that like comforting to be able to go anywhere in the world? Or is it confusing at times like man there's this is happening and this is happening and you could go surf over here and this oh man i don't know what to do <laughs> so the the most frustrating thing it's it's frustrating honestly more than anything because i know where the absolute best place is right now is not being able to be there so yeah. i have major fomo and all my all the other guides make fun of me because i have the worst fomo because I want the fish more than anybody, even though I'm not pulling the trigger or reeling them in or whatever, I want them more than anybody. And when I was doing it on my own, I spent my time and money to be at the absolute best place all the time. And if I didn't know that place, I would find out. And that cumulative knowledge, I, I keep in a book that sacrilegiously I call the Bible and I've kept track of it, but I mean, I know it now. So if a client says, Hey, I've got a week, um, you know, the boat is here where should we be this week? And I said, this is the absolute best place to be right here. And if that's not good, here's second, third, fourth, and fifth options. And those are the best like comments or, or suggestions that, that we make, you know, to clients, they have a general idea of what they want to do, but let us, let us use our intellectual property, which is where and when to go and put you on the right stuff. And that's the stuff that is so valuable for you guys too. You think about how well you know the keys. Like it took that long to find that information out. There's some guys that will come down there new that haven't been down there very long and they'll figure it out pretty quick. And that's a, that's a skill set to be able to go anywhere and figure it out. And those are the people that I respect most in fishing and spear fishing and hunting is the people that can show up anywhere in the world and figure it out. Mm. And some people are just fishy and know what to look for, but I mean, I have, I mean, I've literally gone to college to figure out, you know, the ocean currents and, and everything that goes on in the ocean and, and the right, you know, conditions. And you can figure out that, okay, you need X, Y, Z in Key West for the Wahoo to show up, for the Blackfins to show up, for the tarpon to start migrating, for the shrimp run to start. 
if that's possible here, take that and move it to an area that is similar, like, okay, Okinawa, Japan has very similar conditions that we have because we don't have, they, they have the equivalent of our Gulf Stream, which is the Crucio current called the Black Current. And it's amazing how similar it is. So you have the same conditions that make the same thing happen over there. And being able to do all that, to put together this huge recipe, that's what makes my job amazing. I love it. Man, that's awesome. Well, kudos to you, man. You've done something that is, uh, is really cool, in my opinion. Uh, that, these are the people that I have the <laughs> most respect for, the people that, that can take something that is, is extremely unorthodox or extremely unlikely and then to create a career out of that and thrive. And that's exactly what you seem to have been able to do. And, and it's super cool. Um, so the last question I have for you, what is your definition of success? We just talked about a successful trip, but what is the definition of success? Happiness for yourself and those that are closest to you. Love it. I love it. Cam, thank you so much for this. I appreciate your time. We did a weird thing here with the Instagram Live and asking people questions. I'd love to try to do another podcast in person with you sometime. Yeah. Um, and, and I'd love to get together with you and, and do, the, do the class, one of your classes. If you've got a class, maybe I can sure. drop in on or something like that. I would love that. That would be fantastic. Okay, can you, get, can you tell everybody how to get in touch with you? Uh, Cameron Kirkconnell. Just hit me up on, on Instagram or you can send me an email at Cameron Kirkconnell at gmail.com and um yeah we'll, we'll help you get set up wherever you need to go help with gear recommendations never clients go on a trip they call us and we put together their entire gear um, package and just have it sent straight to them so that they have the right stuff for for doing what we do okay all right man go back to homeschooling thank you very much <laughs> for your time i really appreciate it i love the conversation it was awesome okay. yeah man thank you we'll guys for ya. watching thanks tom see ya okay that's it. Thank you for, uh, for that, Cam.